director of the behavioral health department at our um, office. Um, we want to concentrate this in um, giving the opportunity to everyone to ask questions or, you know, to uh, have this conversation here. So I'm going to start a little bit with um, why we are doing the integration of our behavioral health department in the primary care. Not letting me do it. Sabrina, you have control, so you have to pass the slides. There you go. Okay. Yep. All right. So um, it is not a secret for any one of us that um, we're right now in a in a crisis and um, of mental health and we are in a crisis and I always say when we are talking that there is a time before and after um, COVID-19. So we were in a very difficult moment on uh, in the mental health um, for all our kids before COVID-19 and after COVID-19 the situation is even getting worse. Um, the American Academy of Pediatric declared in 2019 that we were in a crisis and uh, was always encouraging all pediatricians and all primary care doctors to ask questions, to talk to their patients, to talk to their families, to see how we can support them. Um, what is out there is what is making everyone to realize that those kids need more help than what they are getting and that we all need to get involved. Next. As I say here, um, you know, what is going on after uh, COVID-19 in our kids? Well, it's a disruption on the sleeping. Every single age, I have um, the opportunity to talk to parents when I'm coordinating the services for them, uh, that they say, I'm not sure because this is, a, this is a COVID kid. And I say to them, oh, what do you mean with a COVID kid? Well, I have a very traumatic delivery because I was in a hospital by myself. I did my sunburn no one can help me i have to be there for five days i was traumatized there's no way to get out of the house and you know i don't know he's not being in a school he's not being in a park so those two years that are extremely important for that development of that child were were not what we were usually do so that's something that when i am coordinating the services for the patients i get a lot um in a school age well, he's very anxious to go to school now because uh, we worry about getting sick or adolescents. Um, you know, I, I was two years in doing this um, home school. I was always an anxious kid, but now I'm worried about what is happening in my school. We have other crises. We have violent situations in the school. So um, um, the, mental, the mental health of our kids is definitely being affected. Um, you can go past this, uh, Sabrina. This is a little bit more of what is happening in your kid, in youth kid, and, and especially with kids with special needs. Um, we're having an impact on kids with special needs as well. Um, you know, no wanting to go to school or worry about going to school. Uh, kids going from um, high school to the university, that transition is always difficult. Um, now it is more things going on uh, in 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 our um, environment that they are they are feeling affected. They are feel like you know I, I'm gonna be able to make it happen. So um, the point of this, you can pass, Sabrina. Next, the point of this is it's a wake up call. So um, why we are trying to encourage all pediatricians, um, primary care doctors to do mental health. So and how you do it, that's what is important. So um, let's talk a little bit about our model and what pediatric partner is. Pediatric partner is a pediatric office that um, is being established since 25 years ago. We are celebrating 25 anniversary this year where um, the support for behavioral health is always being there, but the needs for more, it was a wake up call years ago. Um, 
We have 14 providers. Um, nine of those providers are pediatrician certified, board certified pediatricians. Five of them are comfortable and well training on behavioral health. OK, those are pediatricians that are we're investing and we're investing time and investing for um, conference and investing for uh, education for them to feel comfortable. I always say to um, our providers, the knowledge give you power. So why you are afraid of, of treating your patient, why you are scared with a mom is telling you in an eight years old, nine years old, having issues in a school, very anxious, just avoiding going to school um, or not concentrating in school, where, where they are going. They need to talk to us. They need to talk with their pediatrician. They need to talk to their office, the office that has been supporting them for years. So you want to support them, but you don't know how to do it. So investing time in your team, investing effort in your team, investing on education in your team is what is going to make a difference. So five of them are very well trained. We have five nurse practitioners also, um, two mental health therapists in office, two licensed social workers, four board certified registered nurse, uh, and they use as a, you know, they are, we use them as a case managers and myself, I, I direct the department. So um, how this work is that, um, next Sabrina, Everything was put on place, but having the opportunity to show others and having the opportunity to meet all those measures to be able to be recognized for this um, happened a few years ago. So we are um, recognized by NCQA as an, a distinction for behavioral health integration. We're also a patient centered medical home. Uh, and what that's mean is that we try to support them here in office, OK? Uh, before they call somebody, they call us. Before they talk about crisis with somebody, they talk to us. Um, if we are in a crisis, we have a mental health counselor here. If we are in a crisis, and sometimes it just reorganizes what the service the kid need, talking to the school to see what is happening, how we can help. So we have social workers for that. Um, understanding what is medication, what is behavior. So. That's why we make the difference, and that's why we're very proud to have this distinction um, because it recognized us and also made parents to feel better and to feel more comfortable, to feel like, okay, I don't need to see a psychiatrist. Um, and we can talk about why, why no psychiatrist at the first time, um, why I can feel comfortable with my pediatrician who knows my family, who knows me, who knows my child, treating my son, treating my daughter. Next, Sabrina. So what are the benefits of this? Um, and we try to explain this to all the staff um, is that early intervention, feeling comfortable and confident with this, uh, more family folks treatment, we talk about it, and avoiding unnecessary referrals. So there is not the same when you are having a place where you can go and they know my daughter is having headaches every single time that she's going to school. Uh, but when she's not going to school, she's totally fine. My son is having a stomachache and diarrhea every single morning at 7.30. I see him very anxious getting out of the car, and he's now calling me from school because he's feeling sick. As soon as we are home, he's comfortable. On the weekends, we don't have any problem, but if it was a Sunday night, I'm having some meltdowns. So having a practice that you can talk to the provider and the provider can say okay so we need to extend your child we need to make sure that this is not something physical going on uh and after that i suggest you as a provider to see one of my colleagues see one of my pediatricians see my therapist in office to support your child because i believe what are we your child is presenting is some anxiety tendencies, and we have to address them before it gets worse. So having a provider that is comfortable to refer to their own team in office and to talk about parents and say, OK, this has been going on for a month or this has been going for two months. We're not in an emergency that I have to put him on an emergency consultation tomorrow with a behavioral health provider, but we can talk about it. This is the strategy that I'm going to give it to you and then you will have your appointment. I'm going to talk to my therapist to see if they can call you and get you on a schedule as soon as possible. So when you have a team that knows that 
they have a supporting team and they can take care of the patient. They don't send the patient out. They don't refer the patient out. When you're having a provider that is well trained, they don't send the patient to the ER because the patient is having a panic attack. They can handle the panic attack here, talk to the parents, make them to understand that this is nothing physical, but it is psychological and we need to address that. Next. What we treat here, everyone asks me that, but we treat everything. ADHD, kids on the spectrum, general anxiety disorder, depression, obsessive compulsive disorder, post-traumatic um, stress disorder is very common right now, disruptive dysregulation disorder, eating disorder, insomnia. I always explain to parents when we're doing our process for the consultation that Getting the kid evaluated does not mean that the kid needs medication because I have a lot of parents reluctant to talk about it because they are afraid of medication. We always say the consultation appointment is as how we do it. The consultation appointment is a 45, 60 minute appointment where you are going to talk to your pediatrician about your concerns. Your pediatrician is going to observe your child, is going to talk to your child, is going to get the feedback from your child from you, from your, you know, from the father, and determine what are the assessment or the medical um, or the psychological assessments that needs to be complete. We want to talk about that next. Next, Sabrina. Um, what are the assessments that we need to complete and what is the approach that we are going to do? After that, they have to come back for a follow-up consultation. And in that follow-up consultation, after getting the feedback in office from parents, the feedback from the patient, the observation in the room that is extremely important. I always explain to the parents, this is not an appointment where your pediatrician is going to put in a stethoscope in the heart of your child. This is an appointment where your pediatrician is going to talk to your child about how he's doing in school, how she's feeling with the friends, how she's sleeping, what is happening. See the dynamic between parents and patients. OK, see how the patient is behaving in the room. Uh, after that observation and after all that feedback, the provider assigned assessments, uh, psychological assessments that are going to be complete by teachers, by parents, and by the patient, if the patient qualifies for that. We get the results and after those, all those things are being together, they get a follow-up consultation appointment that is a 30-minute appointment where the pediatrician will sit down with them and say, based on all that we did, your child is meeting criteria for ADHD. What is ADHD? They explain what is the ADHD. They let the parents understand, talk about it, and says, okay, is your child meeting criteria for medication right now? Or we can start implementing therapy, strategies, academic strategies at home, how we can support him in school. Then we get involved the psychology or the therapies that we have in office, and then we get involved our social worker to try to give them services. So um, we do the evaluations, we do the age appropriate um, um, assessments. Um, we have a sensory room. Why a sensory room? We have a therapy room because this consultation for a pediatric patient cannot be only in a regular room where you are just talking. If you are evaluating a four years old, a five years old, you have to sit down on the floor, make the kid to do stuff, make the kid to paint on the wall, make the kid to um, jump in the room. So you are observing, you are evaluating, and the kid does not know that they, they are being evaluated. They are being playing in this doctor office, and the doctor and the uh, psychologist observing the child in the room. So that's why we have that. Our triage nurses are very important. Um, they talk to parents that do the case manager management and see how the kid is doing. Is the kid on medication? How is responding to the medication? When the child needs to be seen? So that is extremely important. Go next, Sabrina. Those are the assessments that we use. We do everything electronically. We use Charis, that is a program that you guys may know um, that has all the, the assessments. Um, Vanderbilt, uh, stress and difficulties, um, for depression, for anxiety, scared, uh, all those, but they are online. We assign them to the people that we have to assign that is appropriate and they complete it and we get the result. Other thing that we use is MHS, that is a, another platform, another system. 
uh, to get those corners um, that are online assessment also for ADHD, but it is the pen of the age. They um, we, we assign it, they complete it, we get the results. The report from uh, MH is, is amazing. Uh, Autism Navigator is something that we were part of and we use a lot um, to help and determine, you know, um, kids on the spectrum. And we also use, uh, and we do it in office with our um, social worker who is a developmental specialist. Um, we do the CARS too, that is an assessment um, to um, support the diagnosis of ASD. Uh, we always try to teach our providers that you don't need to send a patient to a neurologist to get a diagnosis of ASD or a, to a developmental pediatrician. Pediatricians are totally entitled to do that. They need the support, they need the observation, they need the right way to do it, but they can do it. Um, we do this assessment here that is now being requested by a lot of insurance to uh, be able to provide services. Um, it is not paid by insurance, Dr. Sharma will go um, on that a little bit more but we provide that in the office. So we have it in the office, we schedule an appointment for that. We do the test, that is one hour test. It's all on hands, patient in the room, following all the directions they have to follow. And then we get um, together, we um, set up a report, and then we bring the patients back and talk to them about what are the results. Next, Sabrina. Um, we get in both because we always say, all of this that we're doing cannot just be in the office. So to be able to support your patients, you need to support them outside of the office. They are coming here. It is, I always explain to parents, this is not only about medication and fixing somebody. Your kid is not broken. Your kid needs support. Um, so we're not fixing it. We're helping your child to succeed. So we get involved. We have a social worker that is two social workers that are very involved with our schools. We get reports from a school. We get reports from patients. But you're gonna have patients that say in a school they cannot handle it, but at home I can handle. Or you're gonna have patients that says parents that says at home it is insane, but at school he behaves. So we need to understand. We need a second opinion. We need to know what the school is implementing. What is happening at home? Um, where uh, in both, we provide 504 letters when the patients meet criteria for that. Uh, no, when they don't. Um, we do a lot of presentations, webinars. We're very involved in the um, ASD community. We're part of the, um, I am part of one of the boards uh, for one of uh, the schools for kids on the spectrum here. We collaborate with them. Kids on the spectrum uh, need a lot of help. And when they are very low function, we have kids in group homes. We are kids that cannot be vaccinated um, in um, a CVS and 18 years old, 21 years old, very aggressive child. We go to the school. We go and do what we have to do over there. We have to do an observation. We talk to the ESC coordinator. We try to support because when parents, schools, therapists and pediatricians work together, this is a successful service. When it's not and there is no communication, it's almost impossible to make it happen. Go next, Sabrina. So now you're going to have the expertise of Dr. Shetman. We're going to start with when and how prescribing psychotropic medication. You guys know how to do this, but we're going to talk a little bit about it and then we can go on questions. Dr. Shetman. Thank you, Payola. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to go through these slides relatively quickly because I want to be able to provide more time certainly to ask specific questions. Um, and in general, I think the concept here is that as pediatricians, we're trained in medicine. Um, we may not have been trained in prescribing psychotropic, psychotropic medications in medical school or residency, but we were trained on how to use medications. And often when I speak to pediatricians, I mean, as you know, I don't know how many of you are prescribing uh, medications, um, but certainly hopefully a good number of you are, but it's, it's often I come across the discomfort, number one, from pediatricians, uh, as well as nurse practitioners, family practice, uh, primary care physicians in general, to be managing, treating children with mental health illness, and also the fear of trying to a treat with um, someone with psychotropic medication, but a medication is a medication. Yes, you need to learn the specifics of a new category of medication, but it's no different than if a new antibiotic came on the market. 
And obviously in pediatrics, especially outpatient, there has been no uh, new antibiotics. So, um, so this is at least maybe intellectually challenging, which it is, but it's also intellectually rewarding. Uh, um, I often also tell pediatricians when I first, um, about 30 years ago, I was on a medical executive uh, committee or board for one of the uh, local hospitals. And at the time we were challenged with the concept that we had to certify uh, provide uh, hospital privileges for surgeons with laparoscopic services. Now, when I trained in the mid 80s, there was no such thing as laparoscopic surgery. It's hard to believe that it's so common at this point, and now we have robots doing it. But at that time, it was brand new. Surgeons would go off to a three day weekend course and they would learn how to do laparoscopic surgery. And so I've always figured if they can learn how to do surgery as such, that was all new and within a weekend we can learn the same thing and with medication so it's something to keep in mind i think the best thing you can do is as Paolo was describing the process take that time i think don't try to squeeze in just a regular office visit you do need to take that initial time for that initial consult to connect and relate to the patient understanding and it gives you a much better insight to where you want to go with that patient uh, because as everybody here knows um, unlike diagnosing an infection, diagnosing thyroid disease, we can't do a blood test. We can't do an imaging um, study that gives us specifics. So there's a lot of subjectivity to this diagnosis, even though we have wonderful uh, rating assessments and other psychoeducational tools, those are certainly also just subjective in their own way. Yes, they're standardized, but certainly not something that's absolute. Um, giving, listening to that patient, uh, and listening is the key word to the patient, to the parent, connects you with them and trying to understand and making them understand that there's no, you know, this is a journey you're taking together and together you're going to learn to see what's going to be in the best need, best service for that patient to be able to provide the support. Always, if we, uh, you know, understand, teach the concept I, at the same time, because teaching that concept of the therapeutic index. So we're all familiar with therapeutic indexes when it comes to anticonvulsants, um, thyroid medication, but when it comes to psychotropics, we really don't have that, you know, a blood test that we can measure the blood level. Yes, for some of our anti-epileptics, we can certainly measure those levels, but those really are based on, you know, need for uh, seizure therapeutics. So what I, I learned at a lecture years ago um, from a, a professor from Mass General Hospital, when she got up there to talk, try to describe this concept, she said, let's think about that therapeutic index. Look at it as a ratio, and the numerator is the benefit that you're achieving from that medication, the functional outcome, the functional benefit, and that's, again, what's being related to you by the patient, by the parent, by the teacher, and in the denominator, you're getting all the side effects. We never expect to get perfection. We don't want, however, we don't want to just um, settle on good results. We want great results. So we're trying to increase that uh, numerator and then decrease the denominator. Um, and it, at that point, we get a very you know, heightened or optimal therapeutic index. Always going slow and low with medications, um, especially when you're first getting to do, start dealing with psychotropic medications. Do not hesitate to bring back that patient even every few weeks to see how they're doing, to get that feedback, to work with them. You learn as a physician, you learn a lot. That's how I learned. And then you start becoming more and more comfortable with the medications, understanding what sort of guidelines or guideposts, I should say, you need to use as you prescribe. Certainly, we want to avoid polypharmacy. Um, it's probably one of the biggest problems and errors that we see, um, especially, unfortunately, coming from some of our colleagues that are psychiatrists. And it's one of the things when patients come to me after they've been with a psychiatrist, you know, they could come here with six, seven medications. Um, as I tell them, I'm comfortable managing multi medications, but I'm going to try to minimize and mitigate how many medications your child has to take each day to get the optimal outcome. And again, as I said, the frequent follow ups are important. Go ahead, next slide. 
Thank you, Sabrina. Anyway, there's a lot of good resources. You're sitting there at USF. I know you know all about the books in the uh, lower right uh, quadrant um, and the title Psychiatric Services. Uh, I think on the page before, some of you may be aware of the REACH program, which is a three-day mini fellowship program that is intensive learning that is provided over six months in which, during which time, um, I think it's every week or every two weeks, you do with a, with a um, smaller group of participants, you do live cases presenting and having feedback from experts. And so again, many different ways of learning. Someone just told me that I think um, Mass General now also has a program that they're providing to teach primary care physicians mental health. Um, next slide. Sabrina, oh, there we go. All right. so. Let me just, I don't know, we can do this, but maybe just by a show of, uh, I guess, raising your hands. How many of you are currently um, prescribing uh, psychotropic medications? Okay, all right, a few of you at least, that's good. But those of us that are um, in the last several months, in the last six months, but certainly since 2023 began, are uh, dealing with something that is horrific. So we've always, which is the sh national shortage of medications. Um, it's something that hopefully at some point we'll get some national resolution and recognition. Um, we need to be as physicians advocates for our patients, physician advocates for ourselves, uh, and most importantly, get our parents, our patients to advocate for themselves. The way that we were able to you know, I mean, we've had some great success nationally with now reducing the cost of insulin, both for Medicare and now commercial use. It was all through patient advocacy, and we need to do the same thing here. Those of you that have been using stimulants and ADHD medicine for years recognize that, you know, our patients have a lot of issues, even before this shortage began, with pharmacies being treated as criminals because they're being prescribed C2s, the CVS, the Walgreens of this world certainly are, you know, treat them as though that they're coming in for oxy and and that becomes difficult. So it becomes difficult for them to find, locate a medication and often are not provided with good patient care, but not customer care either. This recent shortage, there's a lot of rumors out there. It's hard to know exactly what the root cause is, but certainly part of it has to do with perhaps FDA and DA uh, regulating the number of meds dispensed in this category. Uh, especially with um, the uh, the main ingredients of the uh, pharmaceutical medications. Um, there's supply chain issues, like there's supply chain everywhere, but it is also an issue with retail chain drugstores not allowing us as even physicians to be able to find out whether or not they have medication. I mean, we want our patients and part of what we have done since we are overwhelmed with these requests and changing um, is the fact that we make our patients now call around to try to find it very difficult uh, because a lot of pharmacists will not uh, provide that information. We have set up a preferred list of pharmacies for our patients that's on our website and most of them are independent uh, pharmacies because they're much easier to deal with. So something to think about, create those relationships both as a um, physician and as for patients. I just got a text right before we went on this webinar. One of our um, most cooperative, friendly, and, uh, and most useful uh, independent pharmacists, uh, Chris just texted me just telling me what strengths of Focalin XR he now has in stock, which is down to, I think, three out of six or seven presentations. So it's trying to create the collaborative effort. I've spoken with CVS national pharmacists about this problem. I have a regional CVS um, pharmacist coming to see me, I think this coming Thursday, um, trying to look at what can we do to make everybody's life easier, but mostly importantly, most importantly, to get patients the care they need. Um, you know, of course, the other thing that um, is the recognition, I think, with pandemic um, recognition of student ADHD, when parents had to sit at home all day with their kids doing, you know, a virtual school, they recognized how that their kids truly did have a problem and the issues that and the challenges that teachers had. So I think that's brought more awareness um, amongst parents for that, as well as our recent awareness of adult ADHD uh, has also created a huge demand. One of the things that we're seeing here in Palm Beach County, oh, I don't know if you're seeing it there, but I've had a call the school district. We have schools or teachers or a school nurse recently called DCF. 
um, because she said the parent, the mother refused uh, to bring in the child's, you know, replenish the child's 1 p.m. Um, Focalin, I think, uh, wh whatever, me whichever medic, whichever stimulant it was. And all of a sudden, my office, I got a call from DCF trying to check in on this parent and whether or not there was neglect. And my response to the DCF worker said, I want you to call the head of um, DCF at Children and Family Services, call the DOH in the state um, and tell them this is happening because we need more access to medication. This mother tried tried multiple pharmacies. There just was nothing. So she was reported. That's not her fault, obviously. Created more stress. We have children being suspended almost every day because of their behaviors are not tolerable to the teachers, understandably, because they're off their medication. Next um, slide. Um, hmm, let me skip this slide. Um, let me, anyway, one of the things that, yep, that's it. So another thing that this, to me, this is somewhat exciting, um, but the Biden uh, plan for when we go off of emergency, you know, pandemic emergency status is to start requiring in-person doctor visits uh, as a first visit before prescribing any C2, which does include the ADHD stimulants. One of the things that I've become very aware of, it's very scary, but there are pill mills out there um, one is called, I just dropped the names, um, Done, and the other one, I can't think of it, but there's two big national um, online programs that you call up and say, you know, uh, I'm Tommy, I'm 24, uh, I need some AD, uh, Adderall, and they prescribe it. And what I found out from one of my other pharmacist friends was that there are here, one of the main streets here in Palm Beach Gardens is PGA National. Uh, and there are offices with just telephones in it, no furniture, no nothing else. And those are the addresses that these pill mills are using to prescribe controlled substances. So hopefully this whole plan, yes, is going to be a little bit more regulatory demands on us as providers, I think, but at least it may shut down all this um, overuse and overprescription of uh, Adderall, which could be one of the major reasons why this shortage began. Um, next. So uh, one of the other things that was asked to just talk about, there hasn't been that much new in the field of ADHD meds. Let's keep it in, um, you know, again, just in a very broad scope. Uh, ADHD meds are stimulants and non-stimulants. Um, stimulants are essentially two subcategories, one amphetamines, uh, which are your Adderall, Vyvanse, and multiple other um, presentations, and then your methylphenidate, your Ritalin uh, products, which there are dozens of. Essentially everything, there's different forms, as everybody knows, patches, liquids, sprinkles, and so forth. Um, and so one of the challenges we always, and then there's non-stimulants. And as far as um, new medications in the last year, two years, um, there's Asteris, which is, um, a prolog, uh, pro drug, excuse me, uh, with short acting dexmethylphenidate, and then another form of the uh, methylphenidate, dexmethylphenidate that gets dissolved uh, much lower in the intestines. Um, I don't have much experience with it. It's supposed to be lasting all day, whatever all day means, because of its expense. And again, you, as everybody here probably does know that you know without insurance subsidy all these medications can be anywhere from three to six hundred dollars a month and so it becomes prohibitive and it's something when i talk to patients about starting medication not only do i need to find the right medication the right dose for their child but also i talk to them about sticker shock um and that you know just because we prescribe one medication if another medication is one third the cost, they need to give that consideration and understand. And if we need to change, we will. And of course, now, as I've already talked about, our fourth arm of all this is the fact that availability is another problem. Um, Zelstrom is, uh, it's been approved by FDA. I think it's the first dextroamphetamine patch long acting that's coming out. And I think it's supposed to come out sometime this spring. And then Kelbury, which has been out, I think close to two years at this point, is a non-stimulant. It's also similar to a tamoxetine. It doesn't work the same as the tamoxetine, but it's an old uh, antidepressant that was not used in this country, but used only in Europe. And then and they've been found to be, um, you know, useful for ADHD. Um, 
my limited experience with this so far in the past two years has found it to be more helpful than uh, I find it tamoxetine, stratera, but it's, you know, maybe 40, 50 percent having some limited expense. But once again, the cost of Kelbri is exorbitant. So that's another thing that makes it hard to use. Um, next slide. OK, before I do this, I think we did skip the slide on transition. I don't you know. I think one of the things was just the concept of um, transitioning uh, to adult medical care. We all deal with that. Um, I happen again because I, you know, I've managed this practice and I've known for years that children with special, especially children with special needs, we've taken, we, we do continue to take care of them, um, not just for psychotropic medications, but, you know, just even their general care, um, often into their 20s, sometimes even longer, because there really are not, especially in our area, any adults that are, you know, adult PCPs, you know, we're all adults, um, pay, doctors that take care of adults uh, willing to do it. But again, I think it's important um, it's always a conversation we have with parents. I think that parents have to recognize, um, you know, that transition uh, is not just transfer of care, but needs to be thought out, needs to have a discussion, need to have a discussion with a child, need to have a discussion with a parent, whether it means, um, you know, starting to talk to them about if, if need be, you know, starting to arrange for guardianship when we often, our social worker often does have that interface with the parent. Um, but more importantly, even with a child who's more neurotypical, is the concept that as they turn 17, 18, getting ready to move on to college and out of the parent's house, that the parents have to, I have this conversation all the time, have to stop uh, enabling them. So um, it's something that I think we all need to always, as pediatricians, um, give some you know, th thought to and some uh, conversation with our families. Um, last slide. This is just a quick video of uh, our sensory room and one of our children going through that sensory room just to give you a concept a little bit more. Hopefully you'll get volume. Sabrina, can you try to turn on the volume? I'm not sure. It's not just go ahead and play it. Yeah, I think I'm stopping it. OK, go ahead. This is one of our sensory rooms and one of our offices um, that enables us to help um, sort of de-stress ch uh, children with, um, you know, who have sensory issues. Even if the child, we, as you all know, we often draw blood in there, even in our neurotypical children, because again, that can be a very anxious moment. So with that, I wanna thank you all for your time, but open up for questions and 